Hello and welcome to Lecture 20. We're going to cover sections 9.5 and 9.6 from Young, 14th edition. Uh, the topic is going to be the moment of inertia, um, how to derive it and how to calculate it, and then um, the something called the parallel axis theorem, which represents one of the things we can do to work with the moment of inertia in order to solve certain problems. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and take a look down at our key formulas here. So this is um, a pretty concise topic. The goal is to discuss the moment of inertia, uh, which I described before as also known as the rotational mass, because that's the role it plays in the same way that mass acts in translational systems. So in other words, the bigger moment of inertia, the harder it is to accelerate a object, okay? And of course, that would be angular acceleration. Now we represent the moment of inertia with the letter I, okay? So that's what we have here. And this first formula for the moment of inertia shows a summation symbol. And that's because this formula represents the moment of inertia for a system of discrete particles. So this would be the opposite or the alternative of a, object, of a continuous object, like a solid. So this works for a system of particles, essentially. So moment of inertia for system of discrete particles. So this formula with the summation should be very, look very similar to when we introduced the center of mass, because then we had two versions, the integral version and the summation version, one representing a discrete system and the other a continuous object, a solid. Likewise here, okay? The difference was that when we calculated the center of mass, we were concerned with kind of balance, finding that balance point of the mass, not necessarily having a point that had equal mass on either side of it, but the balance point of the mass, okay? Of course, very important for the effects of gravity. But here, the role is different because it's not just the balance point of the mass, it's really what the mass is doing to the system, how the overall distribution of the mass affects its rotation. And so it turns out that that effect is proportional to the square of the radius. So we see here then that we have a mass of particle m, but there's that squared radius, particle i, excuse me. And the radius, well, that's the distance from the axis of, of rotation. So this would be the radius of particle i. And what I mean by the radius is the distance from the center of rotation or axis of rotation. So distance from axis of rotation. So what's important to understand here is that the distance plays a very important role because sure, the mass matters right, just like it would in a translational system. But where that mass is located matters more because we have a squared squaring that effect rather than having it be linear, okay? So in effect then, if we had, if we had a system of you know, multiple particles and we wanted to sum it up, then we could find the total moment of inertia by doing so. And we'll see, see an example of that. What we will see more likely and what we'll see a little bit more frequently is the moment of inertia of a solid object. So this is the moment of inertia for a solid. Because of course a solid is a continuous system of particles. There's, there's no finite number of little pieces that you can split a solid into. So in that case, instead of summing a finite number of particles, instead we're going to be integrating over the total mass. Okay, so this is the mass element the same terminology that I used when introducing the center of mass. And the effect here is just the radius. So that would be, as we're actually using this integral, we're then going to have each little mass element is a distance r from the center of rotation. And we're gonna then sum up all of those mass elements. Of course, in effect, we always have to do a substitution for dm. We always have to replace dm with something that is itself a function of r, otherwise the integral is not solvable as written. So the last, the last formula here is, some, is the, something called the parallel axis theorem. The 
parallel axis theorem. And what the parallel axis theorem is, is a very help, helpful formula that allows us to take a moment of inertia that we perhaps found by using the formula directly above, the one with the integral, one for a solid, right? And then moving the axis. So perhaps the axis was in the center of the object when we solved the integral, maybe it was at one end, which in the example I'll show in just a moment. But then when we actually want to answer a question, perhaps the, our object is not free to rotate about its end, but instead free to rotate about some other point. That means we have to actually move the axis of rotation. Well, when we do that, this is the formula that we can use. And what it allows us to do is to find the new moment of inertia about any axis of rotation relative to the moment of inertia around the center of mass. But it's not, notice that this isn't the moment of inertia around the center or any arbitrary point, but specifically the center of mass. It only works for the moment of inertia about the center of mass. And so what this, this is essentially telling us is that we have an extra effect, right? So this is, we're moving that axis. So this is the moment of inertia about the center of mass. And when I say about the center of mass, what I'm really saying is the moment of inertia relative to an axis of rotation that passes through the center of mass. But it's shorter to say about the center of mass. And one thing to be clear about with, with this formula, and I'm gonna make a little bit spa space by moving this, this label up here, is that the reason it's called the parallel axis theorem is that these axes, the new moment of inertia axis and the previous center of mass moment of inertia axis, well, those axes are parallel to each other, hence the name. So they have to be in the same plane. So if I was to draw a plane, something like this, and then I have some object within that plane, perhaps a cylinder, all right, let's have some blue cylinder. All right, so this will be a solid object. All right, at least we can imagine it as such. And then let's draw an axis of rotation, something like this. Okay, so this will be our original axis of rotation. Okay, this one is about the center of mass. And then if I want a new axis of rotation, then I would move it there. Now notice those two axes are parallel to each other. Both axes, both of the two axes I've drawn are, they're not perpendicular, right? They're not at angles to each other, they're parallel. So and if the, we're interested in the rotation of our cylinder about that new axis, then we could compare it to the rotation about the original axis, and the distance between the two would be h. All right, so this is our value of h. Okay, and then the total mass is m. Okay, that's the total mass of the cylinder. So that's, that's one way that we would use the parallel axis there. All right, so those are the formulas out of the way. No key terms or anything. The only key term is the moment of inertia. And let's get on to some examples. Now, the first example I'm actually gonna leave for you to solve. I wanna, I wanna show you one of the other ones, and then this, this, will be, this one will be for practice. I know it's unusual to have the first example left for you, but you'll be able to go back to it after you see how the other ones are done. So let's go ahead and flip the page and take a look at a ranking exercise just to get an idea about moment of inertia. And then we'll do the one big example that will, that will end this video. And then in part two, we're going to um, show, I'm gonna show another example with um, the parallel axis theorem, which is not gonna show up in this video. Um, well, me, no, I misspoke. It's not gonna show up prominently. And then also an example involving an object other than a rod, which will be a sphere, okay? All right, so first, the, so in other words, question one and example two will be the, the um, we'll finish up this video. So in question one, rank from largest to smallest, the, um, the moments of inertia I1, I2, and I3 of the three objects shown about the midpoint of each connecting rod, okay? So the midpoint in each, in each case is just, you know, is just the line shown here, right? So there's a midpoint, midpoint, midpoint. So that's our axis of rotation in each case. So that means we wanna think about how, how these moments of inertia compare. Well. Let's think about it. So for the first one, I'd have I, I'll call this I1. Well, for that one, I have, I know the formula is going, is going to be m r squared, okay? Well, here my m is two, is two little m, right? So my total mass is two m. And each of those mass, masses is a distance of r from the axis. So it's just gonna be two m times r squared, okay? Because again, that's, that's my distance r 
right? And then my and I just did that twice for each one, which got me two m two m r squared. So effectively, it was m r squared plus m r squared, which gave me two m r squared. Okay. Well, what about for this one? Well, for this one, I'd have i two, and I'll show the summation on this one, right? Because this one I'd have two m times r over two squared plus m times r over two squared. Okay. So if you think about it, then I'm gonna have, those are like terms, so I'll give me three m, but then I'm gonna end up with this, this square, the two squared, which will be four, so I'm gonna put three fourths m r squared, okay? And kind of center that a little bit, there we are. And let's do the same thing for the third one. All right, this one's more symmetric, so I'll just, you know, multiply by two. So I'm gonna have two, and then I'm gonna have m over two, and then I'm gonna have two r squared. Okay, well, let's think about that. So those twos, I have a couple twos that cancel, right? But then that's gonna be four. So that's gonna leave me with four m r squared. So we see then that the rank from largest to smallest is going to be three and then one and then two. So the rank is three, one, two. Three, one, two. Now the logic behind that is because the radius matters so much. So the one that's really lengthy, where the mass is really far away, even though it's less mass, the fact that it's twice as far and we're squaring that effect means that by far it has the biggest moment of inertia, right? It's twice as big as the, the second biggest moment of inertia of these three objects. All right, so that kind of really gives you an idea of how what moment of inertia looks like as we calculate it. Now let's take a look at example two, okay? So in example two, we have a rod that has a non-uniform density, okay? So how are we gonna tackle this? Well, there's, this, is, this is kind of the, the, the whole point here, is we're gonna start by finding the moment of inertia about an axis that passes through its left end. So this is for part A, this is gonna be our first axis. So I'm gonna label all three of them, all right? So this is our, kind of our first rotational axis. So we'll call this part A. Then in part B, I asked for the moment of inertia of this rod about an axis that passes through its center of mass. Okay, well, center of mass is going to be kind of off, off a little bit to the side. Okay, so we'll go ahead and draw that as well. It's not right in the middle because our rod here gets twice as dense, right? It starts off with a certain density over here and that density becomes twice as dense as we get to the far end, the end that's furthest away from the zero here. Okay, so this will be the axis for part B. All right. And another one will be right in the geometric center, which will be this one right here. All right, so that will be part C. Because it's not, the center of mass and the geometric center aren't too far away from each other. All right, so that would be the axis for part C. So hopefully that kind of makes it clear what we're talking about. But then how do we actually tackle it? Well, the approach should be very similar to when we found the center of mass of a non-uniform density rod. So please refer to the lecture on center of mass. In fact, I'm going to, in the interest of time, show the result from, from that to start. So I'm gonna start by saying, recall that the X center of mass for this rod with lambda equaling, so lambda as a function of X, let me show that as a function notation. So lambda as a function of X equaling lambda naught times one plus x over l times, um, well, that's it. Okay, so that's, that's our, our function. Now, I got that function actually, um, so quick, quick note on this, is if you think about the information that we're given here, is we're told two, two bits of information about the density, right? We're told the density at point zero and then we're told the density at point l. So on an axis that is x, we would have two values. We would have zero and l. And then we know that at zero, the density is lambda naught, and at L, the density is two lambda naught. Well, then when we actually draw a line to connect those two points, then we can actually just use the equation of a line, you know, kind of point intercept form of a line, knowing that the intercept is at lambda naught, and then that, that gives us that formula. That's exactly where it comes from, okay? So it just comes from the equation of the line. So for that particular rod, right, and for that function that we interpret from the word problem, we found in, in the previous notes, in the notes for center of mass, we found that that rod has a x center of mass of 
five ninths L. Okay, so five ninths L. And again, refer to those notes. Okay, so then let's actually calculate the moment of inertia. So what is that gonna look like? Well, in part A, we'll use the integral, okay? So we have I about the, um, the far end, okay? So that's gonna be, um, we'll just call that I naught because it's kind of about the origin as it's drawn, as our chosen axes are shown. And that's just gonna be equal to, just, for, just start with the def definition before anything else, okay? So then the very next step is to do a substitution for dm. So I wanna write the mass element in terms of lambda dx. Okay, so that's gonna become x squared lambda dx. And then I'm gonna replace lambda with its function form. Okay, so then it's gonna be, and here we can already um, have our limit be zero to L. Okay, because we're gonna be integrating over the entirety of the rod. So now we have a definite integral, x squared lambda naught times one plus x over L dx. Okay, so then we're gonna go ahead and carry on. All right, so go ahead and start um, solving the integral. So the constant lambda naught would come out and then we would have x cubed over three plus x to the fourth over four L and then evaluate that from zero to L, which then would just give us lambda naught times seven over 12 L to the cubed. Okay, now, that's not the right form, however, right? I mean, we can't present a moment of inertia with some unknown you know, density function of the units of this lambda naught or kilograms per meter. And we also have too many Ls, right? We have L cubed instead of L to the third, right? The, every moment of inertia will have the form M, you know, like some constant times MR squared, right? Think about the, one, the ones we saw in the previous lecture. Cylinder was one half MR squared. Um, this, the, um, the spherical shell was three fifths MR squared. A, shawl, a solid sphere is two-fifths mr squared. You know, we have, um, or I, sorry, I think it's two-thirds for the, the spherical shell. But you don't have to memorize them. I mean, well, the ring was exactly mr squared, right? So all these results have that, they all have that in common. They don't look like this, right? This is not a finished moment of inertia. And that's because we have to do a separate integral for any non-uniform density object. And that's what's called a total mass integral. Because the total mass integral will allow us to express lambda naught in terms of m and l, which then when we substitute it back into our expression will give us our moment of inertia. Because the other thing that's wrong with this moment of inertia is there's no m in it, right? And the moment of inertia should have m in it. That's what's different than the center of mass. The center of mass is just coordinate. The moment of inertia actually does depend on mass as well as distribution of mass. So I think you get the point. Let's do our total mass integral. All right, so that's just gonna be dm. And then we'll do the same substitution, lambda dx from zero to l put in our functional form of lambda, right? Our non-uniform density function, which was, yep, yeah, just lambda naught, one plus x over L dx. Go ahead and do the antiderivative, and that will, that will give us three halves lambda naught, three halves lambda naught times L, right? So again, you know, make sure you understand that step. So then if I go ahead and solve for lambda naught, which I wanna do on this line, there we go. So that means that lambda naught, right, in terms of m and so forth, is gonna be two thirds m over l, okay? And then I'm gonna go ahead and substitute that back in and find the answer to part a. So thus, the moment of inertia naught is going to be our two thirds m over l, right, because that's just replaced lambda then times the 7 12th that we got from the moment of inertia integral times L cubed. Obviously we have a cancellation of one of our L's and we clean things up and we get 7 18th ML squared. See, now it has the correct form. Make that a little bit more legible. 7 18th ML squared. All right, put a box around it and we're done with part A. Now, part B, and C are all about using the parallel axis theorem, right? So we actually done, done with the calculus, all right? But do again take note that we had to do two separate integrals. I'm gonna kind of give those a little label here, right? So we had, we had our moment of inertia integral, which was this one here. Do, do, do. Right, that was integral one, and then our integral two was this one, 
right? So you always have to do those two separate integrals. And technically, if you were doing this from scratch and not able to use like a you know, separate problem, you'd have to find the center of mass itself, at least answer part B and C. And so that would be a third integral. You would, there would be no fourth integral because the, the, the one for expressing um, lambda naught in terms of M and L would apply to both the center of mass and the moment of inertia integral, so serve double purpose. All right, so let's go ahead and nice one of the circle A's. Make it extra obvious that these are the two, two key steps. There we have it. All right. So now let's use the parallel axis there to answer part B, which is the moment of inertia about its center of mass. All right, so we'll use parallel axis theorem. So use parallel axis theorem. Okay, and that's going to tell us I come, or excuse me, I not is going to equal I com plus M times H squared, okay? Well, what's H? Well, H is the distance from the center of mass to you know, the location that we're dealing with, which we know is 5 ninths, right? So H is 5 ninths, okay? So then if we actually solve for I com, we're gonna get I naught, the thing that we solved for in part A, minus M times 5 ninths, because again, that's just the distance from the origin to the center of mass, right? That's this, this distance right here, this one right here, okay? All right, so then 5 ninths, square it. All right, and then clean, let's you know, at least show the intermediate step. We know this is, we already know this is 7 eighteenths, ml squared, and then minus, and basically we'll just write it like that, 5 ninths. And then this is one where you, you don't really want to put, write as a decimal. You can, but I think these ones always make sense to write them as fractions. I would certainly recommend that. And so even this one, even though this one is an ugly fraction, I would leave it as a fraction. And it's 13 over 162 ml squared. Okay. Make it a box. Yeah. All right. And then in part C, we'll just do that one more time to get over to the geometric center. So then I center is going to be, and notice that one thing, right? I said this in the introduction, but notice here, right? I'm gonna compare I center to the center of mass and then M, and I'll call this H, H prime to differentiate it from the H above. So M H prime squared. And, but notice, right? I'm comparing the center to the center of mass. Here I compared the end to the center of mass. You know what I can't do? Is I can't compare the end to the center, because neither of those are the center of mass. And the parallel axis theorem only works comparing through one axis to the center of mass axis. You will get the wrong answer if you just compare between two arbitrary axes. That's not what it's based on. I'm not gonna prove it, actually proving that the parallel axis theorem is beyond the scope of the class, but that absolutely is the case, so do take note of it. All right, so let's wrap this up. So here we would have our center of mass one, so our 13 over 162, m, L squared, and then finally our M. Now H prime is just gonna be five ninths minus one half. So this is the difference between five ninths and one half. Because we're just trying to find this small difference, this small, that's our H right there, that's our H prime. All right, and so let's go ahead and actually leave the, I'll go ahead and leave these labeled in the picture for future reference, right? So this one right here is the H, this is H, and then the smaller one is H prime. So H prime is much smaller and its exact value is five ninths minus one half, okay? And since we have to square it, so it'll be five, long thickness, five ninths minus one half quantity squared, all right? So here's the coolest thing. When we do that, we get one twelfth ML squared. And as we get more practice with moments of inertia, and perhaps even as you've done the homework or looked at the moment of inertia table and reading the chapter, you might have noticed 1 12th ml squared is actually the, the moment of inertia for a uniform density rod about its center, which is also its center of mass, because uniform density, its center is its center of mass. There's no, you know, center of mass is closer to one end. But that's the same result we got here. That can't be right, can it? Can the can the moment of inertia about its center for this rod that's twice as dense at this end compared to this end have the same moment of inertia about, about its midpoint? Well, actually, yes, because our mass distribution was linear. Sure, it increased, and our result about its center of mass, its center of mass, 
right, the non-uniform center of mass, is different than the uniform density's rod's moment of inertia about its center of mass. But when we take that point right in the middle, it doesn't matter that it's denser at one end than the other. The, dense, the density difference cancels out. And so it turns out that even if we had a rod that was four times or five times denser at one end, we would still find about its midpoint, its moment of inertia would always be 112 ml squared. Okay? Its moment of inertia about its ends or about any other point on it will be unique to it, but about its center, it won't be. Okay? And so that's actually kind of a nice way to check your work. Make sure that everything worked, worked out because you better get this result because it's true for any linear distribution of density. Okay? So that'll wrap up this.